יום טוב, סבבה? אוקיי. אוש. אוקיי, תודה רבה. אני רוצה להודות על ישראל אינסטיטוט של אדוונס סטודיז על ספקטקולר חייב מונטס, ובאמת החוסט, ליאן, רון, בפרטיקולר, שעשו את כל העבודה, אני חושב, and uh, and the rest of the gang for making it so much fun okay um, I'm going to tell you today about a decision to see consciousness through the lens of decision making um, okay so when I when I was um, a, a junior faculty I lived in Seattle and I learned to sleep like this young mother I learned to sleep through the rain and then I moved to New York and I learned to sleep through these traffic sounds can you hear the traffic sounds Yeah, okay. But, you know, when I was also a young parent and I heard this, I uh, woke up right away, just like she's doing, or about to do, yeah. And so, um, look, you know, it, the, the non-conscious, the unconscious brain is making a, an unconscious decision to engage the world to the sound of the baby cry, but ignore those other sounds. And I'm going to um, put forward a very broad thesis and then narrow it down into the consciousness we care about in that there's two characterizations of consciousness, uh, one that comes from neurology, which was my other vocation for a long time, uh, and that concerns states of arousal, and the other from philosophy, which concerns states of awareness, subjectivity, authorship, narrative, etc. And um, that they share a common framework viewed through the lens of decision making, which is as a decision to engage. So my talk has two parts. Um, I'm going to tell you some experimental evidence with a little background about decision making and the subjective feeling of having decided what we call piercing consciousness and, um, and then try to develop an, uh, a novel argument, I think, somewhat novel, uh, uh, in, uh, for about consciousness as a uh, decision to report. And since it involves reporting and consciousness and decision making, I think that I, what this really should be titled is, is um, a, a, a macrobious redux, thanks to uh, Toto Rabah to uh, Itzhak Hen for teaching us about uh, Macrobius this morning. So, okay, so the decisions, decisions I study in the lab with my colleagues is our perceptual decisions. They involve making, I can't see what these, making a decision about the net direction of random dots. Hopefully you all see the net direction of these dots as rightward. If you don't, talk to me later. I'm a neurologist. And, uh, and in many experiments, we might record both the choice you make and how long it takes you to make it. And uh, 20 years plus of work has told us the following of how this works in the brain. Noisy information from the world gets transduced by sensory neurons that are selective for motion, say right versus left. I call that the momentary noisy evidence. Okay, some of the noise from in the brain, areas of the brain that contain direction selective neurons like area MT here in this opened up sulcus. Um, and they, uh, the, the momentary evidence is really a difference between the firing rates of rightward and leftward neurons, okay? And that difference I'm showing here is this Gaussian distribution on its side with a mean greater than zero to him because the, the, uh, the, d the deterministic component of this is, in fact, rightward. Okay, so um, in the brain, though, to make a decision, we need neurons or mechanisms with longer time constants that accumulate as a function of time that momentary evidence and ultimately perhaps stop when there's sufficient evidence, say, to choose right or stop at this uh, lower bound, I'll call it, uh, when there's evidence to choose a mo uh, left. And that, that nice thing about this, this bounded evidence accumulation mechanism is that it simultaneously reconciles which choice is made, the right, and when it's made, this time here, okay? Um, and um, just to give you an intuition for what uh, the flexibility uh, that this, uh, that this um, mechanism confers is that imagine these stopping bounds were closer to the starting point of the accumulation, this trial would have ended with a left choice, and, uh, but at the savings of some time. That would have been an error, but faster. So you get a sense that this mediates the speed versus accuracy trade-off. Okay, now in our hands, which means working with humans and monkeys, um, if we measure reaction time, which is the time that elapses from the onset of the random dot motion until that eye movement responds, that's the way both our humans and monkeys make their, uh, indicate their choice, and that'll become extremely important uh, in a second. Then um, uh, we plot that as a function of the motion strength, which is shown on this sine scale, so that zero is the most difficult case, it takes a long time, almost a second on average, and these 50% Uh, coherence, these are the motion strengths, because I didn't say this, but the, the random dots can, have, uh, can be all noise, which is the zero case, or they could have some probability of motion, which is what 0.5 or 51% represents here. 
And that's the easiest case. So positive means right, negative means left. And you can see that's taking less than half a second, or more like a less, le less than a four tenths of a second in in over here. And, um, and so, OK, so that's the reaction time. Now, the interesting thing is we can fit these, this function with the, with the um, analytic solution to the stopping times uh, of, this, of this stochastic process. And here's the equation for it. T is the reaction time. Uh, and um, you, I've already introduced these other terms. B is this bound height. And uh, there's only an, one other term that matters, which is this multiplier, k, that converts motion strength, uppercase c, into, um, into a signal to noise. Okay? So that's all it is. There's a little extra non-decision time. We won't talk about that today. It matters. But these two parameters basically describe this curve. And then this just shifts this curve as a whole up and down. Okay? Now, um, the interesting thing about this is that, remember, this mechanism reconciles both the choice and the reaction time with the same uh, mechanism. So um, here's the equation for, the, um, for the, uh, the probability of choosing right. That's what I've plotted on this axis against this same motion strength. And this is a logistic function, but you'll notice it's a function of the two terms, uh, k, the bound height b, and the motion strength. Uh, and um, we've already fit those terms to explain the reaction time, so we're left in the situation of predicting what the choices should be. They should be at these two motion strengths, per just about perfect. At these two motion strengths, again, al always at left, that is never answering right. And then the, the transition from left to right should go at exactly this rate. And, um, and that's pretty much where the data lies. So that's a prediction of choices based on another completely different set of measurements, reaction time. And I think it, it um, supports the idea that a mechanism like this, anyway, is, um, um, is supporting both the choice and the reaction time. We didn't invent this idea. It really was came, this basic idea for decision making came from Abraham Wald, who was a refugee from Austria. Um, in, in World War II, he did munitions work uh, secretly at Columbia. Alan Turing used this as an important step for breaking the Enigma code. Um, that was classified until the 70s, by which time Alan Turing had died. But he'd luckily, his uh, right-hand man uh, at a statistician, a guy named I.J. Good, a famous Bayesian, uh, published uh, um, Turing's contributions to probability theory in, uh, in his book, Good Thinking, in a short paper, which uh, you can find on my website, I think. And a bunch of people um, have decided to apply this to, um, to cognitive decisions, uh, including perceptual decisions, uh, some of them in the room, like Marius Usher. Um, OK, so there's this nice neural correlate of this process in the brain. It's in many parts of the brain. We tend to emphasize the parietal cortex, um, uh, just because it was the first place that uh, Bill Newsom and I looked when I was a postdoc. Um, but, um, but I don't want you to think that this is the only place in the brain that does this. This is a monkey brain with a slice, um, an MRI, cut through the, um, the intraparietal sulcus. That's what this is and this. And right in this orange region is the lateral intraparietal region, LIP. Um, it was identified by Richard Anderson on, on the basis of its projections to the superior colliculus and, oculomo and, and frontal eye field. Okay, it's the part of Brodmann's Area 7 okay, that does that. Now, the interesting thing about LIP is that it has this long time scale. And that's brought out in the simplest uh, experiment one could ever do with memory, which is a working memory for the location of a spot. We ask a monkey to make an eye movement to the remembered location of that briefly flashed spot. Here's where it was. And we can listen to this neuron as the monkey waits to make this eye movement. So that was the uh, monkey's eye position in yellow. This is the persistent activity as the monkey waits to make the, the eye movement to the remembered location of the spot. And, um, and this elevated persistent activity is, I'm going to encourage you in the, in the context of this talk to think of as kind of a state of knowledge. Uh, it might be a plan to move the eyes, a place in space. Um, where was this object? Um, and, um, uh, and, and to be a little bit philosophical, this persistent activity is the key to understanding many aspects of cognition because the key to cognition is a freedom from uh, immediacy. Or um, as uh, Ava Jablanka, the next speaker, uh, has told me um, uh, is uh, a, a term coined by um, our favorite philosopher, uh, other than Aristotle, sorry, Ava. Um, is uh, is um, uh, is uh, th uh, the term uses the term uh, th thickness, temporal thickness of the present. Anyway, I think in evolution, this was this escape from immediate action that is being beholden to immediate changes in the world or the need to control body musculature in real time. It's that break from from immediate time that is the key to understanding cognition. 
Now, these neurons in LIP have persistent activity, as I showed you. They are also spatially selective. So here the spot was off to the left. That's the trial I just showed you. And now you can see that there is no elevated persistent activity as another level of, of activity. And what we do is we exploit experiments to understand decision making by, putting, by asking an animal to make a decision uh, in favor of, say, about these random dots so that it will answer by making an eye movement here, where the neuron's active, versus here, where the neuron's uh, suppressed, perhaps, okay, or at least not active, all right? And at, at some level, that should be trivial. Though. This neuron will tell us the answer to the decision once the decision's made. But it turns out it's less trivial than that because the neuron's response evolves during the period of motion viewing and before the monkey ever makes an eye movement. So this is, this is the uh, activity from the neuron in solid, um, this is an average from about uh, 50 neurons, but the, the, um, the solid curves are trials that are going to end with the monkey answering right, that is the target in the response field of the neuron. Okay, and then these in dashed curves are trials that are going to end with the opposite choice. And immediately you can see that, that the solid curves are above the, da uh, the dashed curves, so this is a neuron that responds more when the monkey is going to answer in one direction compared to the other. But it's the evolution of this which is as a function of motion strength. So gold is the strongest motion strength, the one I made a joke that you should uh, talk to me later if you don't see the motion, the easiest one we show the monkey. And then um, blue is actually pure noise, but there's fluctuations in the stimulus that, that, that support left and right, and also the monkey accumulates that noise, and he ultimately makes a decision based on that. So there's some kind of information bearing on the actual decision the monkey makes. And then red is just one of, this, one of those many intermediate uh, um, levels of, mo of motion strength. And so you can see the fact that these are all different tells us that these neurons aren't just telling us about the plan to make an eye movement. They're also representing the evolving evidence, the support, the, the, the reason for making the, this one choice or another. Now these same responses, these are cut off at a median reaction time for each of these conditions, but these same responses come to a surprising, well maybe not so surprising, um, um, common level of activity just before the eye movement. Uh, and if we split those same trials, we use all the motion strengths and divide by quantiles of reaction time, so here's the fastest quantile, and there in, in, in indigo, the slowest quantile. You really get the idea that they come to a common level just before the eye movement, and that's a sign of this bound, of some threshold, something downstream of LIP and other areas like LIP, but something downstream of that that senses that's enough information we're pulling the trigger going to make the eye movement. Okay? So, so those are the neural correlates of this process, and we see it playing out in many, many brain areas. Okay, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, the same mechanism is at play um, when uh, viewing time is controlled by the environment. That is, so not, now we're not measuring reaction time. Okay? And um, we know that because if we look at the probability correct as a function of viewing duration, each of these are different motion strengths, you see there's improvement if we, a, as we increase the, the motion strength. And if we plot the threshold, which is just some arbitrary uh, the, just the, the, the motion strength that supports, say, 75% correct is, is one, one definition of threshold. We plot that as a function of viewing duration on a log-log scale. You'll see it obeys a, a, a slope of minus one-half, meaning, meaning the threshold is improving, the sensitivity is improving by the square root of time, which is exactly the, the, the uh, performance improvement expected for perfect integration of information. That is, until about half a second, in which case the improvement is much more modest. Okay, and why is that? Well, some people used to think that this was because uh, you, there was a, a leaky integration that you lost early information. Okay, you couldn't integrate. There's like a biophysical limitation. Um, or, uh, but the other possibility is that no, the, the brain stops because it has enough information as if it was doing reaction time. And the evidence for that is very clear. Um, if you put a little pulse into, the, into, into um, a pulsive motion, rightward or leftward, you can affect the, the monkey's choices in this case, same, the same thing works for humans. Um, but if that pulse, that's true if the pulse is early in time, but not if it's later in time, the effect of that pulse. Okay? So in other words, the early information affects the choice, but the late information is ignored. So that's a sign that the reason we don't keep improving, or the monkey in this case doesn't keep improving past about a half a second, is because he ignores the late information because he's basically done making the decision. Okay? 
And this is the same thing holds for humans. So what we deduce from that is that, is that this is where an overly complicated diagram for the point I want to make, but say the integration after some, you know, there's a long latency before we see the integration begin, but if this is the representation of the integrated motion, uh, integrated momentary evidence, that is the accumulated evidence for right versus left, then at some point, even though the stimulus was on for all this amount of time, say 800 milliseconds, at some point um, the, uh, a bound is hit and the animal or the decision is over, okay? And that's what we think is going on. So we began to ask the question, are we consciously aware of having decided? Okay, there's no external manifestation of this decision. The only thing we know indirectly is that performance only improves by square root time up to a point, okay? So, um, so that's, that's a question that we wanted to pose. And, and we did that um, by asking if we, if we could get people to um, report their subjective decision time, okay? And uh, the way we did this is the, uh, a technique called mental chrono chronometry. It was already mentioned once today. Um, and this is a technique uh, um, uh, introduced into the, to the field by Benjamin Libet to do these, I think, oh, I agree with, um, was, it, was it Leah? Did you mention this before? Yeah, that they're pretty silly experiments. I mean, the, the silliness is that, of course, something happens in the brain before anything else. I mean, to a neuroscientist, if we if we had the will to move the hand and nothing had ever happened in the brain beforehand, that would be very scary, okay? So, so I, mean, there's, I just don't think it bears on free will or anything like that, that, that whole set of experiments. And nonetheless, um, well, here's the experiment's incredibly complicated. It took us two years to pilot this, because we, it, and it's, you can almost, you can imagine how difficult this was to design. The, the, the human uh, watches random dots motion. In the center of the display, though, there's a clock. Uh, it, okay, uh, it, you'll see it. I'll show you a demo of it in a second. The human's fixating. We're monitoring the eye movements. The motion's on, say, for, I'll say, 800 milliseconds, because those are the only trials I'm going to show you. Um, and then it turns off, and there's a delay <laughs> period. Clock's still going, okay? Hand's still, still. He's, uh, there's really a stylus in the hand. Okay, and then through that, through the delay ends, and there's a little go cue, a little beep. And, um, and, um, and then the, um, the, the participant moves the stylus to answer left or right. Okay, and then once they're there, while well, their eyes are still fixated, okay, now, now the, cl the clock has stopped at that point, and, the, and, and they have to then move with their stylus up and down to adjust the place of the clock to where they felt that they had made their decision. Okay, I'm going to call that a subjective decision time. So here it is. I, I don't think I have time to show you this movie. I'll, I'll come back to it at the end if you want to see it, okay? Uh, I'll show you a little bit. <laughs> I, I always do this. It's crazy. The problem is there were like five things to watch in this movie, but you, the, 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 okay, that, that was a trial, all right? <laughs> did, did it mean anything to you? So you, they're staring there, they, they move the stylus, and then they moved it up and down to move, the, to move the clock back to where they thought that's when they made a decision. They click a little button, they said, that's it. Okay, the, and, okay. That, and that the reward only comes at the end, that little ling, that, um, that was because they got the, the subject got it right. Okay, anyway, now, one of the problems with mental chronometry is just some subjective report. How can, we, how can we know that it's true? Well, I've kind of given you the trick. What we do is we say, let's, let's hypothesize that those subjective decision times um, are, um, are in fact real, end, real termination events. They are threshold crossing, something that accumulated and, and that was the stopping time of that accumulation. And if that's true, let's fit those, those subjective decision times just as we did reaction times and, and uh, with this function. And then let's see if that was really correct, if our hypothesis is correct, then we, could, we should be able to predict the choice frequencies, okay? And so, so, so uh, that's what we did. And there it is. So this is one of the subjects. We did a pretty nice job fitting this subject. Here are three more subjects. And you can see they're all different in their, in their subjective decision time patterns. And those all give rise to different predictions of what the choice function should be. And for these four subjects, um, that was the, the, con the um, consilience was awfully good. Um, for this fifth subject, it wasn't, and um, I, I'll, I won't go into why um, I, the answer is. We don't really know, but, it's a, that, but clearly it's, it's, this is not, a, uh, uh, this is not a, a technique that is guaranteed to work. Okay. All right. Now, let me just um, tell you what I think we've learned from mental chronometry so I can go to the next part of the talk. So completion of a decision, I can read it here can be um, subjectively experienced, and it's a, it's a reportable event, and, uh, and it's an, what we, you know, some would call an aha moment, okay? And it has some content to it, left or right in this case. 
Okay, this confirms the, the work we did with the monkey that was by Rizbekiani in monkeys, and it validates to some extent Mint, uh, Ben uh, Libet's uh, uh, mental chronometry. But I, it validates meaning it's possible. Doesn't mean that every time it's used that we can, we can necessarily trust it. And as I said, it took us two years to get this right. Okay, um, so um, it suggests that piercing of consciousness, the, this aha moment, um, conf is, is a, uh, conforms to the same kind of, of neural mechanism as a threshold crossing operation. Um, and I would argue that, it's a, that, that um, this is a decision to report invokes conscious awareness by definition. I mean, if you, were a, if you wanted to study conscious and non-conscious processing, you say, Did you, were you aware of this thing? Were you aware you made the decision? If someone would say, yes, then they're conscious of it. Uh, you can challenge me on that. But I'm, they, that sounds pretty trivial, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow that up and, and, and make a whole theory out of it about it reporting. And it's going to be the center of, of what is a, a very simplifying theory of consciousness. Um, but subtle, I hope you'll think. Okay, so um, it's, um, it's, and the idea is that it's mediated by the same mechanisms of, de of decision termination. And admittedly, we don't really understand those uh, very well yet. Um, we just know they're there. Okay, so I want to make a point that not all um, decision terminations result in consciousness. I'm using this italic C for consciousness. It's, it's no longer motion strength. Um, and um, nor is it true that all pre-terminal decisions are not conscious, okay? All right, so now I'm going to build, build this argument up, okay? And I, 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 I expect lots and lots of, um, of uh, criticism, and I hope that you will share it with me openly, and um, I can take it, um, uh, and I hope to learn from you. Um, so, okay, so the, the structure of the argument is as follows. I'm going to first have to introduce the notion of a Gnostic or a knowledge state, um, and that will include provisional affordances. We were introduced to affordances by um, Liad earlier, um, and, uh, and the content uh, that they confer to non-conscious states, for the most part. And then I'm going to introduce a special affordance, a social affordance of reporting, and I'll, and I'll embellish that a bit um, with theory of mind and narrative, and the content that that confers to conscious states. Okay, now confers is the word I'm going to use because I think it makes intuitive sense to all of us here. But, you know, listening to Orly this morning, I feel almost justified by skipping the, by substituting for the word confers, the word is. Okay, so um, I think that's the gist of, of her argument, um, a, a, a very uh, beautifully made, if you want my opinion. Uh, thank you, Orly. Okay, so um, this is, um, um, uh, just to give, to give you an idea about knowledge states or Gnostic states, I call them Gnostic states because the, they're negative, that is, in disease, are called the agnosias. So the parietal and temporal lobes, which are the sites that when they're damaged, at least in certain ways, um, you get the uh, various kinds of agnosias. One agnosia is Wernicke's receptive aphasia, by the way. Uh, the main agnosia that we typically deal with in neurology is neglect, um, or um, anos agnosia when you're not even aware of your illness. So if you have this right parietal lesion, uh, you don't see the left half of the world. You don't draw a clock, the left side of the clock. You don't render, you know, uh, you make mistakes on the left side of, of all kinds of objects. You might recognize his face, by the way, but you don't, but you don't um, uh, um, recreate the eye and so forth. You don't notice if it's missing. Okay, so, um, um, right. Um, so now, I want to say that these, these Gnostic states conform to affordances, all right? And um, so um, I'm going to just, um, it, it, we were introduced to affordance, but I'm going to define it for you. The qualities or properties of an object that define its possible uses or make clear how it should be used. And affordance theory is sometimes said that the, the world is perceived not only in terms of object shapes and spatial relationships, but also in terms of object possibilities for actions. And those are called affordances. This is a term coined by J.J. Gibson. And um, I highly recommend his book. I rejected it once when I was younger. I thought it was just incredibly dumb. And many of you probably were, you know, were raised on computational neuroscience and, and David Marr and things like that. And, and, and I was just not ready for it. And I've gone back and reread it, and I've become a complete Gibson evangelist. Now, um, um, so Gibson and Merleau Ponty are my muses. Okay, so. Um, so anyway, and I think Gibson wouldn't have, ex wouldn't have put it this way. I think he would have put it in terms of what he calls direct perception, um, and that comprises knowledge uh, of, of states corresponding to what he 
co coined as affordances. Let's, um, let, let me just give you a, 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 a kind of a fun demo of this. So this guy is from the web. This guy is, is in Italy, was pulled uh, off for drunk driving, and these cops are going to uh, give him a breathalyzer test. That's the breathalyzer. Okay. So, all right. So, so that's the that's not give, now you know what an affordance is. Okay. It's a little it's a little cruel. I feel a little dirty every time I show that. But, um, but anyway. Um, so, okay. So I want to I'm going to make the point that affordances are are are, are the gnostic states for especially for non -con most non conscious things we do, um, and um, so they have persistence. Um, there's the Merleau-Ponty or the temporal thickness of the present. Uh, they are, um, uh, they're free from immediacy of their causes, that is, they outlive the evidence that produced them, and their consequences, they don't necessitate action, okay? And, oh my God, okay. All right, yeah, okay. All right, and, the, um, and they are the outcome of a decision process, okay? There's, it's a state change that led to something to say, now, we're gonna now the brain's going to hold on to this, 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 this representation, but that representation is of the possibility of something that might be done, okay? And uh, I think that corresponds to Gibson's direct perception. I only wish he were alive so I could challenge him with that. Okay, so um, now, we already talked about one affordance. Space. Okay, so I would argue, just to be really concrete, that this kind of persistent activity that I showed you before confers spatiality, awareness, not awareness like awareness in consciousness, but where, <laughs> N-E-S-S, you know, like location, to an object someplace in space before I know what that object is. And my brain, by kind of grasping it, in a sense, and holding a response, and uh, actually me passing messages as I move my eyes and head and so forth, so there's this thing is held, there I have implicit non-conscious knowledge of this place in space, okay? And, um, but all non-conscious for, for now. And, uh, and, okay, so, yes. Now, let's keep going. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Okay, so I showed you uh, neurons in, the, in LIP, uh, sorry, LIP, that, that represent, that take information from the visual stream about motion and construe it as evidence bearing on the relative valence of one object versus another, okay? Now, if we move across the sulcus, we get to MIP. It projects to reach areas of the frontal lobe. Okay, same thing. It responds just like LIP. You could say that it's just construing information as evidence bearing on the salience of places for reaches, okay? And we can go to AIP, slightly different projection, more now to how we gra hold our hand, the posture of the hand when we grasp things, okay? This is the neural correlate, or I would say <coughs> instantiation of affordances. They represent states of the world, they don't obligate actions, but they're all, they're intentional. And so again, they have that persistence, directed, intentional, and they effectively invite us to think of might I questions, okay? You take the parietal patient, who's not aware that they can't see, and you ask them, um, if, uh, if these two houses are different, one above the other, and they say no, because they're, they're on the left side in the neglected field. But if you ask them to choose which house they want to live in, this is a case report of one, by the way, um, um, by these guys, um, they, they will typically, he, she, they, okay, that's a good they. Um, they will, um, <laughs> they will um, typically choose, um, choose, uh, choose, uh, choose this, the lower house. And so, so for those of you who are interested in dorsal ventral streams, which used to be called where and then what, um, and then became how and then what, it's all how, okay? It's all how all the way through. In fact, what it really is is might I, okay? These are provisional affordances, is the way to think about knowledge states in the brain. Now, if you're into that and you kind of have grasped what I'm talking about, you're ready for the consciousness idea. Because consciousness, okay, to a neurologist, it's, it's the decision to engage the environment. But to the people, which I call philosopher's consciousness, um, it's a decision to report, but, it's again, that's an affordance. All events, percepts, and actions afford the possibility of reporting. It's a social affordance because for me, it's re consciousness re in re reporting incorporates a theory of mind of, of a recipient of the report. Okay, so, so I would say what I really think is it's conscious as a provisional commitment to report to another agent about whom one has theory of mind or you reporting to oneself in the future with implicit theory of mind of yourself, of course. Okay, so um, I want to connect it to a theory of mind because that's where the content's going to come from. So the associated Gnostic states, the knowledge, the thing that's attached to this conscious is not 
space, so but analogous to the spatiality of, of an object, um, it comprises narrative and aboutness. Now, what do I mean by aboutness? Is let's is the, is illustrated in this example. So, um, okay, this guy is um, uh, has a tool in front of him. That's a drill. It's on the table. It has all kinds of, of affordances. Like, like affordance, there's, there's flatness of the table. There's the object is probably heavy. It's, you know, it will require a certain effort to lift. If he reaches to this object, he will probably, if he puts his hand around the outside and he found that it, his, his hand collapsed right into it, he'd be very surprised. He has direct perception of this object as a three-dimensional thing that um, has a back even though he can't see it. Now, Okay, all those things are, are true, all those things uh, normally occur non-consciously. But it turns out this woman's also uh, around, or even just in his imagination. And he's, he, the brain has considered not the possibility of reaching for this thing, looking at this thing, lifting this thing, putting a hole in the wall with this thing, all affordances. This, it also can, includes the possibility of reporting to another about whom he has theory of mind. Now, some of these parts of the object that were invisible to him, they were amodally sensed as spatial and visual, um, he knows that, that they're there for her. Okay? And not only that, he knows that some of the parts that he sees are not available to her because they're occluded by the parts that are in front of her, that are blocking her point of vision point of view. Okay, so the thing is, and she knows, he knows that she knows that. Okay, so now, I'm not saying all that's happening with consciousness and all those words are occurring in his head, but the thing is, this object, the aboutness, is that this object has a presence not in oculocentric or head-centric or even hand-centered frame of reference. It has an, a presence in the world independent of him because it also has a presence in the mind of another. Okay, and um, and so and and when we experience things, this is what Merleau-Ponty called the natural attitude. When we experience things, we think that's what objects are in the world. They're only like that to us in the world. They only have essences. They only have have categories, even in some sense, um, uh, by virtue of the fact that they they have this sort of conscious. Uh, uh, we have conscious awareness of them. Okay, so um, no, that's okay. So I'm going to just summarize the argument now. Um, and uh, it'll take me a couple, how are we doing? Oh, I, I'm going to fly. Okay, many decisions are decisions to engage in some way, including neurologist consciousness. They often or mostly those occur without consciousness for the most part, probably really most part. Uh, they, they lead to these Gnostic or epistemic states, call them what you want, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for good language. Um, uh, which, and these are, all pro these are provisional affordance or affordances to gaze, reach, grasp, uh, you know, things that, like that we think about is in the, in the dorsal stream, to explore, shun, do the four Fs, you know, those kinds of, of affordances in the ventral stream. But you know, all know the four Fs, yes? Fighting, fleeing, feeding, and mating. Okay. And, um, and, uh, and then consciousness is the decision to engage um, as in, <coughs> in reporting to another or to oneself. Um, and a decision to report provisionally confers uh, aboutness. I'm emphasizing the provisionally because I don't want you to think that I'm saying you actually have to make a report. It's just we've entertained the information with that possibility just as we entertain spatiality with the possibility of making an eye movement. We may never ever make the eye movement. Okay? Um, and there are lots of dividends to this idea. Okay? Um, because it, it relates to arousal, it relates to turning on uh, circuits, it relates to attention, um, and, um, and one of them is that um, there are common mechanisms of circuit engagement um, and, um, and uh, with decision termination, which is why I started the talk the way I did in the first half. It doesn't require um, fairy, t fairy dust, um, as, as, uh, as Leon uh, used the term, uh, magic dust, he said, or mysterious operations uh, to elevate a non-conscious representation to conscious. That's a big mistake, and that's, I think we got distracted in that. Um, and, but the nice thing about this is that it's very, it's very, very simple. It's just like every other mechanism that we use non-consciously to make decisions. Okay, so consciousness may be closer to a neuroscientific explanation than is commonly thought. I don't think we're really waiting for the great consciousness messiah to come through. Um, it's, it's really relatively um, mundane. Now, I want to just mention one important limitation, which is that most people who are serious about consciousness worry about what it feels like then, and with the so-called qualia problem. I want to point out that I provided a qualia light argument because the reporting affordance with theory of mind convert, confers some of that public-private um, knowledge um, and the aboutness, and it goes, so it takes us beyond solipsistic utility. It presupposes primacy of the between, mentioning Martin Buber here. A uh, shout out to Martin Buber, and this is because I'm in Israel, but I do sometimes say that in the States too. Uh, just no one knows what I'm talking about. 
um, which inverts, well, that's true in general, but um, which inverts, it inverts the uh, my red is your red problem um, because, because the starting point of consciousness is the presumption of another mind like mine, okay? So we don't really have to have those marijuana inspired uh, talks when we were 18 and still have them when we're 50 or 60, whatever I am. Okay, so the neuro neurobiology of the experienced is missing though. Um, and it shouldn't be dismissed. I think it's a mistake to um, practice heterophenomenology, to use Dennett's term. I think it's a mistake to, to, um, to think it's just um, a made up story. Where's Michael Gazaniga? Uh, we'll hear more about that. Um, um, I, think, I, think it's a, I think that they are, um, I have many of my own working speculations about it. I've listed some of the, the key words, but you can just ask me about it later. They're elusive and I will just be embarrassed to even tell, share them with you, but I think they're, they're, the, they're also within the, the crosshairs of neuroscience. And I can't explain the difference between my own vivid oral imagery, oral in the ear sense imagery, and, uh, but my anemic visual imagery. So I, I'm, I feel like I'm, we're at a loss there. And I'm going to skip the next slide unless you force me in questions. But I just would, I would relate it. And my closest relatives in theories are, are Michael Graziano, who, who puts social theory of mind at the core of his ideas. Uh, he's been doing that for years. And, um, so I feel like he's a brother. I think I can't help but think that ignition is related to you know thinking about decision making. And here I'm thinking of the work of Stan. Multiple drafts, and I have think feel like I have a lot in common with Dennett. The blue stuff is all where I disagree with people. Uh, the, and um, um, and then, but I would point out to be just a little bit nasty that all th any theory that presumes neural representations are conscious versus non-conscious by virtue of anatomy modulation. Things like rate, frequency, synchrony, these are all fairy dust uh, explanations and uh, or resorting to magic. And um, um, on the other hand, those are signatures uh, uh, that may be informative to trying to pursue the neuroscience. So I'm not as dismissive as I sound. Um, so, but they just don't constitute an explanation. And with that, I will stop with a slide. <laughs> I did, Okay, so there it is. Now you see that uh, Magritte uh, rendering, this is, you probably have never seen this painting, uh, rendering his own decision process. Shall I paint Ceci n'est pas un pipe or Le Clairvoyance? Well, here's his answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It was an interesting uh, move of uh, thinking. Um, okay. Um, so, what's the difference? Because it's not uh, uh, enough clear for me. What's the difference between uh, prediction, making a prediction, and making uh, a decision? Uh, because, uh, for example, um, if you're talking about uh, uh, the house, um, so there was a, a decision, a, a decision was made. Uh, the uh, participant uh, chose uh, the, the house that uh, is not on fire uh, and not the opposite. Uh, but uh, when we uh, look at the dots uh, direction uh, experiment, then it's a prediction of uh, whether it's uh, the, wha what, uh, what happened in reality, not a manner of uh, preference. Or maybe I right. No, I think those are there. You've touched on like three great questions. Okay, so so I would substitute interrogation for prediction. That might make it a little bit easier. And the reason to think about interrogation is to think of neurons that are have a message to send to something that might actually do something, and ask back to the sensory or memory, why should I do that? Okay, so that's why I think interrogation is a much better metaphor than the usual processing metaphors. Okay, it's just a metaphor. Okay, so I. The prediction, I wouldn't. I think you could use prediction. You can use a lot of words for what you use, just use prediction for. But I think your point, other deep point, is that is that there. I'm I'm paraphrasing you and sort of like I just, uh, distorting you. Prediction, uh, uh, as uh, uh, it was interpreted by uh, uh, previous uh, talks. Uh, yeah. So, but, but a lot of times people use prediction to say I'm doing this thing and I, pre I the state of the world based on why action should be in this form. My arm should be here by now when I've given this command. Is it there or not? That'd be it, what I would call a prediction. But you know, it's, let's just say it's an expectation. We someone used the word prior for prediction at one point today. So um, I I think all of those things ca can be brought into decision theory for sure. Um, and um, uh, but I think that in, in many times we want to think about is they establish more the 
the kind of question that your brain is asking of the world or memory in order to supply, to, to get it into some state of belief of, in some proposition, which is typically embodied or affordance-like. Yeah, that was uh, really interesting. Um, I have a question about uh, your decision to report. So in, in your one example, you had this LAP neuron that codes what most people would call a working memory. So maybe now call it a gnostic state. Um, but then later I got a bit confused. So when is it in the consciousness according to your theory? Is it when it's kind of being uh, uh, represented by persistent, f persistent firing or no. only later? No, no, all these Gnostic states, okay, if, you, if you'll let me use that term, for, for s w working memory, we're just, it, we're just sort of muddling physiology with, with mental states and so forth. But all those things mostly are n happening non-consciously, okay? So there's nothing about that that required consciousness, and most of it occurs without <coughs> consciousness. It becomes conscious when, not that becomes conscious, but we become conscious of the space when our brain has entertained evidence and reached a threshold to say, I'm committed, provisionally, to report about it. That's it. Because I'm now, I'm, now my state of mind is, not just confers, it, can, it is, is ha, uh, has a, it has a narrative, a nar uh, it's felt as narrative. So, but does then every eye movement? No, 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 no. Only all that's not special eye movements. No, 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 no eye movements. You you can report about your eye movements. You actually mostly can't. Mo most of your eye movements are not conscious, as you know. See, th but but you could report about eye movements. But remember, the key here, the key verb, is not move the eyes. It's report to another about whom I have theory of mind. Da da da. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, oh, the dualist. Yes. Uh, this is not so much a question about dualism, though. Um, I, I was wondering about, uh, so your emphasis on, on affordances, so how do you think about pure aesthetic experiences, so listening to music, where there isn't an obvious utility for, en for any of the sensory experiences that are involved? Um, well, I, I love to go on and on about the relationship between this and music, but basically, and now here comes your prediction, is that, that there is, a, there is a, there's again a social implied communication between the artist and beholder, and in you, your guitar player, you take me a little bit away from the key and I expect you to come back and you take me on a detour to a few islands if you're doing the Odyssey, and, and we've got you know, a, a, an artistic, aesthetic kind of a um, uh, thing going on. That's it, I mean, I... There's no, you're making a decision, I don't, the decision is, did this come in time? Is this where I was, I was expecting, this is why I was pointing to you with the prediction. I'm anticipating a return to the tonic. I'm anticipating a <coughs> on the one. I'm anticipating whatever it's going to be. And, and things I'm, you know, I'm a little teased by syncopation and so forth, and ultimately you deliver, the artist delivers, we hear it, we have different, com we come into it with different backgrounds, we hear it as, you hear it as noise, I hear it as something fantastic or whatever. So, so there's this, you're constantly, to me a decision is just a commitment to a proposition. I probably should have defined it actually. Okay, and so the proposition here is, I expect something to occur here, is it early or late relative to that? I'm doing, I'm flipping between tonality and time, that was for time. Hi, uh, so first thank you. Uh, my question would be, uh, who do you think is the main agent to whom you want to report? Is it, w would it be someone else or would it be yourself? Because then if it's someone else, then it has to be something that you have a way to, to communicate, not just verbally, but in any way of communication. Yeah, I struggle with this. I'm, uh, I think th the theory of mind part kind of implies that I don't know which is primal. Both are both hold. Both are true. But you know, there's or is is you know nonverbal communication with very anemic um, narrative. Um, you know, you know, which had valence because I'm I don't know what I was doing with my mouth, but whatever. But I was trying to make some facial expression and telling you to come on, follow me or something. You know, that's that is that has an implied communication. It's almost as simple as a call. Are these inchoate versions of consciousness? When we have a discussion of levels of consciousness, I think I, we should have discussions about levels of theory of mind, okay, in developmental psychology and so forth. But I won't say there's a hard line here. Um, and with whether the to self was first, like you know, I'm in this environment. Might I come back to this environment? So episodic memories and so forth, um, um, is, that, is, that, is that the beginning of it or related to it or does that come after? I don't know, maybe, all, maybe it's all true because we just have different, different kinds of approaches or different kinds of senses of the same kinds of phenomena. There are a lot more questions. There were three in the first row. Why don't we try to go in, in order 
Rafi has the mic first. And then Kai and then Rafi, <laughs> great. <laughs> I'm too embarrassed. Great talk, very stimulating. I, I have to, to, to talk only about reporting to another person because you're reporting to yourself that's, you know, everybody talks about in that. I think the novelty in your suggestion is reporting to another person. Uh, and then I would say a very simple prediction, if I understand what you're saying, is that uh, elements that are in, you are incapable of reporting them by definition, you should not be conscious of them. And I have one example that refutes this kind of prediction. In other words, if I'm thinking about RSVP, you know, this very rapid presentation, there's no way, and you know that there's no way you can report on these very rapidly changing stimuli, and yet you are perfectly conscious of that. So I, I wonder whether you consider that a refutation of this affordance to report. Uh. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a good like experimental tool. I, here's what I think. First of all, obviously you can cut out my tongue and I can't report, but I am conscious. Okay, so there's all those kinds of things. Okay, so we're not talking about that. And you can e I could be aphasic and I'm still conscious if you talk to patients when they recover from their aphasia, their productive aphasia. But the, um, you know, I think that the, the, we, th there are limitations to how we can get information into the, I think past a bottleneck into the kinds of buffers that are necessary in order to have them support the decision to engage in this mode of reporting, okay? And those things I think are challenged in RSVP and it makes our co whatever conscious awareness we have pretty limited, like we now don't have very rich awareness. But we have, of course we don't have as rich, a, as detailed awareness of most things in the world that, that we think we have anyway, so. What are the predictions of the theory? Um, I hate that question. Um, <laughs> the, wait, I mean, I have, I have beginning to develop predictions of the qualia part of the theory, okay? And that's, that's what, it, that if you eliminated the long range feedback to areas, you'd lose the qualia as we, along, we, along with mental imagery, okay? So that's, but the, the, these predictions are, I don't know. Uh, they, they we, could re we could relate degrees of consciousness, however, I don't know how to test it, De degrees of consciousness to, um, to levels of, of uh, theory of mind. You know, when, when kids break into, uh, you know, when they, do, when they pass the, uh, the, hidden, the hidden rabbit test, you know. Animals? animals, I think it's, it's tricky to test for their theory of mind, but I think that's the way to go with animals, the levels of consciousness to kind of look for evidence for their degree of theory of mind, even in coate versions of that, say in uh, you know, swimming mammals, for example. Uh, so let's say I'm doing this task, and at some stage my neurons reach the boundary and I make a decision. But does it mean that before I made the decision, I was not, ex I was not having a conscious experience of the stimuli? What, what happened before I made the decision? Yeah, I th that's a great question. So I think we do have, we, we, first of all, everything, when we think about making the decision with the bound for the random dots, let's say, there's nothing, you never had to be conscious of anything. As far as I'm concerned, you can do that task, a practice observer, monkeys and humans even, uh, may not be conscious. But on the other hand, you are conscious many times. Sometimes I see the dots and I see something like the Big Dipper and I call my mom, hey, I saw this constellation when I was looking at these random dots, you know. But I think that's my brain has at some point engaged those silly random dots like a Rorschach pattern, you know, as, a, as a, it looked like something I might want to tell someone about. You were constantly monitoring the world for the possibility of reaching, grasping, mating, eating, picking fruit, da da da, all the affordances, and one of those is reporting. And sometimes we have something gets us to the point where we hit the level of we're willing to report. When we're counting the passes between balls of the players wearing white, then we have a very high threshold for thinking about, for getting our brain non-consciously, right? Just like the baby's cry versus the, the rain, okay? Just, not, you know, we have a high threshold for, for saying, I've committed to the idea of reporting about something. You know, your V4, every, your, lots of parts of your brain are screaming away, gorilla, 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 but you're just not conscious of it because you haven't achieved that, that, um, that, that level. On the other hand, maybe you have a low threshold for the possibility of reporting about things like me and the constellation and the random dots, okay? So, um, so then I experience it consciously. That's the way I would explain it.